What would your life look like if you could get rid of 90% of your fear today? My name is Peter Sage and on this video, I'm gonna explain exactly how to do that. Now, the first step is really to understand exactly what fear is. And I'm not talking about your fancy acronyms of like false evidence appearing real. Most people know that intellectually and it does absolutely nothing to improve the quality of their life. So what actually is fear? Well, if we look at the purpose that it serves as a biological evolution of human development, we realize that fear only serves one purpose. It is to get our attention so that it can be pointed towards a potential physical threat, i.e. physical danger. And most people do not know how to separate fear from danger. Now, we know that if you go back you know, pre-civilization or pre, let's call it, you know, safe civilization, there were a lot of threats out there. And as we evolved as human beings, the part of our brain that notices everything, the reticular activating system, that deletes, distorts, and generalizes most information, you know, it kept us fairly safe. But the part of the brain called the amygdala evolved to be on the constant scan out for physical danger. And that's because you know you had saber-toothed tigers and poison snakes or marauding bandits in the next village. You get the idea. So if you are now in a society where thankfully the vast majority of us do not encounter physical danger on a daily basis, but if you're scared of something, what happens is our attention is pulled directly into the moment. Uh, our biochemistry releases cortisol and a whole host of other biochemicals that are designed to mobilize us into a fight or flight response so that we can run away from the tiger or hide or fight, whatever it may be. But there are no tigers roaming the high street these days. Instead, what the vast majority of our fear responses is not towards physical danger, but psychological fear. And again, not necessarily psychological danger, psychological fear. Let me explain. When we're born, we're essentially born with two natural fears, the fear of loud noises and the fear of falling, which is essentially a warning sign for physical danger. But as we grow older and we learn that you know, love for most of us through the model of parenting is conditional, i.e. we do something in a certain way, we get love because mom and dad are happy, we do something that is against the rules of what we've been taught, and the perception of the child is that love is withdrawn or withheld. Now, vast majority of cases, it isn't. But the model that, from the child's perspective is that, oh, mom and dad are unhappy, and that equates to lack of love. Or me being told off is a lack of approval or love or connection. So most of us grow up with the fear that we're not enough, and therefore we won't be loved because we have way more references for doing things wrong than doing things right as we grow up just based on how the model of parenting works. I'm not here to criticize or go into that. I'm just explaining its role in why most people lie awake at night stressed and scared or fearful. So if we realize that when we wake up at night because we're worried about the credit card bill, What's actually happening is your body is saying, oh, there is a danger out there. You need to mobilize a fear-based response. And what that does, it gets your attention to deal with the threat. Now, at that point, fear no longer plays a useful role in biology. If you allow fear to overtake you, it actually shuts down the front part of your brain because you then don't have a way to think your way out of the problem. And the reason for that is it puts you back into the mid or limbic brain so that you can react off reflexes because critical thinking is the slowest form of thinking. And if you're in a fight or flight response, then you don't have time a lot of the time for critical thinking. So if you're lying in bed at night and all of a sudden you're worried about not being able to pay the MasterCard bill on Friday, it's due, it's bigger this month than you thought. Oh my God, how am I going to deal with it? I've got the school fees coming up. I've got the wages. I'm not sure if I'm going to get downsized. You know, the economy's starting to move. All of that stuff. The body hears there is a tiger coming up the stairs. Now, it doesn't know that MasterCard bills do not have fangs. In your mind, you've got you know, all of the bills and worries and everything else and your boss coming up the stairs with an axe. That's how your body is responding. But the reality is that's not happening. 
And so if you stay in the fear of that, worrying about it, your body then goes into a place where it shuts down the front part of your brain, releases cortisol, and now you can't even sleep because you've got elevated biochemistry ready to fight or flight. You get too worried, you can't go into a rejuvenation phase whereby your body's repairing itself so you wake up even more tired than when you went to bed no matter how much sleep you got. And worse than that, you can't actually be aware or think clearly about a solution. And this is the key to letting go of fear or realizing the difference between fear and danger. See, I'm not saying that you don't have an issue on Friday paying the MasterCard bill. What I'm saying is if you're worried about that, you know, fear should get your attention to point towards something. And if it's not physical danger, you have to ask yourself the question, what am I worried about? Oh, it's fear pointing me in direction that I've got a deadline to pay a bill on Friday. As soon as it's got your attention towards that particular deadline, you have to then withdraw from the fact that, okay, if I keep worrying about it, I'm going to invest energy into trying to fight something that's a piece of paper right? You can't win there. It's not a physical danger threat. Instead, you withdraw from that and say, thank you for the fear of getting my attention to something that you know, requires me to think of a solution. And at that point, you switch into critical thinking. The fear response stops. You open up the front part of your brain. You say, okay, what do I need to do if I don't think I can make the payment? Do I need to call them in advance and renegotiate terms? Yeah, most creditors, well, virtually all creditors, are very open to that based upon having a relationship with the customer. If it's a, oh, I uh, need to go and look at creating a second income, or I need to look at how I manage my expenses a little more, yeah, you get the idea. You're now looking at it from a solution perspective, which neutralizes the fear or puts the fear into the box that it was designed for, i.e. to get your attention. But if you live in that box, then you're never going to find a solution. Let's just say, oh, I'm scared of my partner leaving me. Well, is that a physical threat? No, it isn't. It's a psychological fear, which means, okay, it's woken me up to bring my attention to a specific issue. What is the issue? The issue isn't your partner leaving you. The issue is you don't want to be alone. Okay, let me look at that. Now I'm re-engaging my physical forebrain, uh, the part of you know, human evolution that separates us from the animal kingdom that means that, you know, without claws or teeth or the ability to outsmell or run most things that you know, ca do have teeth, we've risen to the top of the apex when it comes to the food chain. So why is that? We can think our way out of problems or we can be put under the weight of the fear so we will never be able to think our way out of problems. And nature is constantly giving us feedback. If you're in stress for long, we now know that stress is a massive contributing factor to virtually every other issue that we could look at in terms of dis-ease in the body. Now, there isn't a medical study that will disprove a strong link between stress and health. However, if I go back to the example, oh, I'm scared of my partner leaving me. No, you're not. You're scared of the fear that you're not enough so that your partner may leave you. Well, let me address that. What would have to happen for me to have more self-esteem? What would have to happen for me to be the kind of person that if they did leave me, I'd say, wow, thank goodness they went so they made room for somebody who's right. What would have to happen for me to let go of the fear that I'm not enough? You know, where does that come from? Was it really just my perception of mum and dad not giving me what I needed because they were dealing with their own stuff? You, know, you start to go on an inquiry, which you could never do if you don't understand the difference between fear and danger. Now, that means the next time you get worried about something, you ask yourself the question, is this a physical danger? In which case, thank you, fear. Let me deal with that. Let me walk away from the cliff. Let me yeah, to put, put on a hard hat, whatever it may be in the situation where the physical threat is. Or is it a psychological danger? In which case, it's like, oh, OK, now, thank you for waking me up to that fact. What's the real issue going on here? And if you start a line of inquiry down there, a, you'll not be lying awake at night worried about anything. You'll be engaged far more in a place where you can walk around being amongst people panicking and have a completely different access to a biochemistry and a brain that can allow you to think your way through or simply realize that, you know something, if I can't pay it on Friday, what's going to happen? 
Yeah, they're not going to cancel my account. They're not going to throw me out. They're not going to kidnap my children. I'll figure a way out of it. Bearing in mind, ladies and gentlemen, that most of your, what we perceive to be dark nights of the soul, that we did stay awake worrying about something, turned out to be our greatest gift downstream. And if you can have a relationship, oh, here's a graduation event. Here is a test in a growth-centric experience of life that is calling me to rise to the occasion. Then you can have a completely different relationship. You can almost be on the lookout for things that used to worry you so you can see opportunity to step up. Now, that requires a level of self-mastery most people don't have. But what if you could develop that? What if there was a way over a short period of time where you could be the kind of person that laughs in the face of fear, that dances with the things that keep people awake at night and really addresses them from a place where other people look at you and go, wow, how did you, how did you figure that out? How did you create a solution to that? Or why are you not worried about something that keeps me awake? And yeah, your response is, well, because credit card bills don't have teeth. You get the idea. If that sounds like something of interest, then click the link below. I'd love to share with you what my self-mastery program actually entails and some of the five keys that I want to share with you on how to develop that. And you could join tens of thousands of students who have benefited from self-mastery, which I like to call you know, the fast track to developing the best version of you so that you can walk amongst them, not be affected by them. That means you can start in your movie as a star, not as an unpaid film extra in a big buddy disaster movie that most people walk around it. If that sounds like a path you'd like to start looking at, click the link. It'd be a pleasure to be able to show how you can get rid of 90% of fear on a permanent basis.